All right, welcome to October 7th in Mycroft Developer Sync. Woohoo, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we kicked off our sprint earlier this week, and uh, I asked everyone to go through and curate their own uh, tickets for, uh, for the sprint. I uh, hope everybody had a chance to do that. Um, and uh, so let's just go through, do a quick status update on where we are, any blockers, anything that came up as a, as a result of, of going through those tickets and, and deciding what's going to be in and what's going to be out. Um, and uh, before we get started, I have an exciting announcement to make. The patent troll uh, that filed against us, um, our motion to dismiss was granted today, as well as a motion to stay, which is a very different thing. Um, so we're not out of the woods yet. They can always appeal. They can always, you know, raise objections. But for now, everything's on hold. We're not doing anything. Uh, so we've won the first round, which is awesome. No, I don't know. We, we the first round was they filed in the wrong venue, so we run the second round too. <laughs> and we will continue to. Uh, oh, also, uh, it's uh, we haven't mentioned it yet, but we could also file an IPR. The inter partes review of the of their patent, so we're going to take that down uh, regardless, um, so they don't go bothering anybody else with it. Um, yeah, they 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 are definitely not in a good way unless they are. Well, I, I they're not in a good way all in all. Like I would I would say that if we were the Google or the Amazon and we're sitting on a hundred billion dollars in cash that they could potentially get into their greedy grubbing little hands, maybe. They, I mean, the fact that we're in litigation would maybe give them a shot. But given that at the end of this, even if they win, they're going to end up with an empty bucket, um, they're in a really bad position. Like they, they had their case dismissed. Their pets are being attacked on two separate fronts. You know, they don't have any revenue because they're not a real company. And then, of course, we've sued them in state court to go after our expenses and any punitive damages that we can get. Plus, as an added benefit, and I'll throw this out there just in case... Uh, the attorneys are listening and can understand words that are uh, longer than one syllable. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we're winning, you know, is likely to cause people to pile on to the case. And so the state case where we're seeking damages, the state of Missouri can uh, reach into that case and pursue them for additional damages, as well as I believe they can pursue them for, for criminal misconduct. And so, you know, given that we're winning, you know, one of the things I'm going to be doing is reaching out to the state government of Missouri and the and the attorney general there and saying, hey, look, like we're going to beat these guys anyway. Why don't you guys pile on and, you know, you can crow about how you're protecting businesses in Missouri from patent trolls. And and hopefully they, they see that as an opportunity to, to represent the businesses in Missouri and they go after them, too. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of great people in our court. We've got United Patents that has filed a an IPR, you know, the EFF has weighed in on it. You know, we're working with Lee Chang, who's famous for beating patent trolls. Um, you know, we're winning. And at, at the end of this, you know, this should serve as a warning to anybody in the future that wants to come and troll us or to try and take, you know, the resources that they didn't earn from us. We will fight. We will win. And you will look like a total jerk in public nationally. Well put. I feel like we're going to be playing Gonna Fly now in the background right now. So uh, as great as that news is, um, it's really a distraction. And so let's move on to the business that we're actually here for, which is making cool, uh, awesome voice assistant software. Um, so I'll start with Chris. Uh, how do you feel about the sprint so far? Uh, so far, so good. Um, I have some show and tell. Ooh. Ooh. I like show and tell. Did Chris just take his shirt off? Because I'm on the phone. I can't see. <laughs> no. Uh, so this is the uh, the intro screen to the tagger. Um, buttons don't work yet, but... Uh, but they'll, they'll take you to the next screen, which is this screen. 
Okay. So, um, screen he showed you so this, this uh, is the waveform library that I was talking about before. Um, this is a waveform I pulled off of the uh, pulled off of the internet for free. Uh, this is just the first screen. Uh, the difference, the only difference between this and other screens, will be the the content on the on the top and the bottom. But the waveform player works. I have a very low tolerance level for stupid bullshit. <laughs> so. Was the that's the way that can run. <laughs> it's Carlin. What? I was going to say, was that Ken? Uh, that was Joe Carlin. <laughs> oh, okay. well, close enough. Somebody, but clearly very somebody out from thing for today's uh, today's news too. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> Apropos. Uh, right. So like, you can do play. You can pause. Level. And the other thing I found out about this library is that if I flip a flag, it translates so it to German flip a flag, then we can do this time boxing. Yes, we can only do one time box. Low tolerance left. But uh, so we'll have to like chop if there's four or five of them, you have to chop them off one at a time. But that all that works out of the box with the library I found as well. Awesome. Um, all right, that's great. So that that was my in my couple of days is getting this is just the uh, this is just the framing. Next is the plumbing and the electrical. All right. Cool. I like the show and tell. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, oh, hey, people have gotten rearranged on my screen now. So Ken, you're next. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I got uh, sidetracked a little bit because I wanted to get the SJ201 enclosure code up to the repository and uh, get it uh, reviewed. So there's a pull request out there for that. And then um, I actually thought the activate button was working, but it wasn't doing what it was supposed to. I rallied back around with Derek and uh, verified its functionality and actually fixed that. So it, when it's not doing anything, if you push it, uh, the activate button acts as if the wake word was detected and it starts the listener process. And I go on the code from the Mark I uh, skill, the way it does it with signals, uh, since all the underlying code use that. But I burned up a lot of time trying to get it out of there and try to get it out to the message bus and uh, for naught. So uh, anyway, the uh, SJ201 library is out there. The uh, skill has been refactored to pull uh, lead switch and uh, volume from, you know, module name blah. So in the future, it could be SJ1. Right now, it's SJ201 underscore Rev A. I assume if something changes, it'll be Rev B and ad nauseum. And then later, if we have other hardware, we can add those. I could even create a re-speaker uh, set as well if we wanted that. Um, and then, you know, depending on how crazy we wanted to get, you could also probably automatically pull that stuff from a config file. Uh, that being said, the pull request is out there. Um, it's ready to be reviewed. There's a little housekeeping left, which is I need to uh, go back and figure out which of these modules required sudo. Um, initially, I did too many of them because uh, I was, you know, learning. But now I've come to learn that the only one that needs sudo is the uh, Adafruit LED library. So um, I have my new SJ201 that I cranked up, the one where the volume's not working. But uh, other than that, I can get line out on it, and the, and the mics are working. So uh, I'll be applying this code that's in the pull request to that and seeing what I need to add to the requirements.txt, which are the modules that are needed that don't have sudo requirements. I'm still not sure what I'm going to do for pseudo requirement modules. They're system wide. I'm not seeing an easy existing path in our setup code to do that. Uh, I'm loath to put it in custom setup, but I may. Um, but I'm not sure yet. But the bottom line is during initial install, there's going to have to be a call out to a pseudo space pip3 install uh, blah. It'll be board and I think NeoPixel. So, uh, once I get that buttoned up, I'll figure out how we handle that, and I'll commit that as well in a separate pull request. And once that gets merged, the next 
build should be supporting the SJ201 out of the box. Uh, so uh, with that done, um, like I said, just some, some more housekeeping. In the morning, I will uh, go ahead and uh, start moving on to the void comp tests for the back end uh, wake word tagger stuff like we talked about. And I created that ticket as well, and that's out there. Okay, thank you. No visuals, but a very thorough update. Appreciate it. Um, if we really need to, we can, there is a, like you can set a, a shell script to, to run on install. Um, it, you know, it used to get used a lot more before we had the more complete manifest um, YAML that lets you install, you know, different system packages and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I really hope we can find a way around the, the pseudo thing because, yeah. Well, we have, so if you look in our setup script, it has a pseudo flag, a command line flag. I think it's called dash R or something like that. And it means to run setup as root. Now, I haven't tried that because that seems a bit harsh to- I mean, I've dev set up. I actually have been in the setup code, the start code, and started selective services using uh, sudo. Um, and that breaks things. I've gone into the uh, pi environment config and said use system-wide modules so that it would pick up the system-wide modules. But unfortunately, there's module clash between the virtual environment modules and system-wide modules that render re inflection uh, useless and, there, and it creates bugs and throws exceptions. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure that I know that I know that there'll be reasons for for all of it. I just I'm hoping we can find a way around it because yeah, um, and I think the the like pseudo during you know Microsoft Core Dev setup thing was was added because people kept doing it, but it's really not recommended. So it was. I, th I think it was added as a, if you really desperately want to do this, then we'll give you the option, but like, please don't. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's just a one-time setup thing. So, um, you know, I, I might go in there and just put an exception path in specifically for these two packages and that's it. Yeah, I think the script even puts up a big red flag, you know, please don't mm. do this unless you absolutely mm. think you need to. Yeah. So uh, that's the housekeeping I have to do. And once I get that done, I'll get on my VK test. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, yes, how about you go? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> a lot of time spent reviewing the Lingua Franca um, PR, enormous PR refactor from, uh, from Chance. And it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really good stuff. Um, so I, I've probably mentioned it before, but but essentially the idea is um, it, it makes everything very consistent throughout the whole library. Because um, currently, you know, the same method in different languages will have, you know, an underscore in, the, in a different place or, you know, just tiny things like that, um, which, which also just makes it a bit more confusing when you're trying to import them in somewhere. Um, and so it actually handles everything from a very high level. Um, so you know you load a language and then you call the consistent method name and it and it just works. Or you can load multiple languages and um, and then you know set during the call which language you want to use in that instance. Um, uh, and then the top level no longer needs to be touched. You know, when we add new languages or new functions to existing languages, um, you just add them to their respective part of the code, and then the the top level will detect that and and load them. Um, uh, and then there's some some good, um, you know, you can set some default behavior if it makes sense um, to do so for any of those as well. Uh, Anyway, so um, it's it's a huge change. Um, took a long time to go through, uh, but it's looking really good. And and really, the, the comments that I made on it are, are fairly minor. Um, and Chance is already working his way through those as we speak. So um, yeah, it's looking really good. That's uh, that's awesome. Hmm. I, I saw a 
comment uh, come through from Chance, I believe it was, uh, about um, a number of uh, discussion topics and um, you know revolving around languages, like multiple languages and uh, things like that. Um, uh, where would those discussions take place? It looked like he was basically asking for, hey, we should split these things, you know, these topics out into separate discussions. Where where would that normally take place? Because I have some comments and some ideas on that. <laughs> um, I am not recalling which comment that you're referring to specifically. Okay. But I mean, they would, depending on if they were, they might take place in lingua franca if, if they're very specific to that or um, uh, less so the chat. I like, I think the chat is good for like hashing things out, but mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not great for searching and, and right. going back to refer to discussions that have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, what about the forum? Yeah. Yeah, the forums is a good one. Um, or, forum. or the Microsoft called repo if it's a sort of higher level, you know, yeah, it was universal. So uh, I, I assume that uh, he was saying that well, probably wasn't the best forum for discussing. Yeah. All right. Um, I may have missed it or I may have been asleep. <laughs> It was it was on Monday, but uh, it's like these are like seven bullet items of uh, things to uh, to talk about. Anyway, mm. um, okay, so that's that's good. Yeah, it'll be it'll be great to get that that rolled in. Um, you know, uh, supporting different languages is going to be really important, obviously. Um, also, saw some chatter on uh, the Czech language stuff. Um, I assume you're on top of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I think we, we need to, it's hard because like languages don't help us get the Mark II out quicker. So, you know, we need to focus on the things that, that I'm half speaking for the community here, um, but like we, we need to focus on the things that, that get the Mark II out and we really want to support more languages. Um, but we're, we're obviously a pretty small team and we, we need to, yeah. I, to, to I do want to point out, I sent, I sent Michael an email yesterday that kind of laid out like and the next eight things in my view, and and you know Michael's view is the one that's going to be controlling here, um, that need to happen. And languages are right up at the top of the list. That the the you know we need to make um, you know custom wake words and custom voices are going to be pretty high on the list. But once we built, once we have the ability to build wake words and voices and we're shipping the mark II, I, I would argue that the very next thing is to is to build the tools required to move Mycroft into these other languages. And and the reason the custom voices thing comes before languages is because in order to support a language like and, and I'm gonna use Hawaiian because there's a really passionate group of, of um, uh, Kanaka here that that really badly want to preserve and, and there's been a real reawakening in the Hawaiian language and the same for Catalan right in in Spain or in Catalonia depending on your politics uh, that are really passionate about their their language and at the same time the the bigger platforms don't support that and so once we've built the tools that allow us to build new voices in English it should be a, not a simple port, everything's simple when you're like, hey, we'll just write some software. But, um, you know, the it should be a very straightforward step-by-step -step process for us to then extrapolate that to any language that can be represented by ASCII and then enable our community to go ahead and start building voices and building NLU in their native languages through the tools that we're providing, right? And And that really is a huge it's a huge win for, you know, everybody who doesn't speak a language that's, that's, you know, spoken by a dominant colonial power. And, uh, and it's a huge win for us too, as a community, because it means that we can support, um, you know, we're, we're, we're able to sell Mark twos and sell our products into these unique markets that, you know, Google and Amazon, frankly, they don't care about. And so, you know, there's, thousands of languages in India, thousands of languages in Africa, you know, thousands of languages in Asia that Google and Amazon will never, ever, ever support because they don't view a 2 million person language as an opportunity. You know, that's a huge opportunity for us to win. Yep, yeah, totally. So I think, I think this PR is a, is a, a great step forward on that. Um, I think the, uh, another piece that we need to look at 
in the not too distant future is automating the translation, the skill and core translation process. So um, it previously was was okay manually triggering these updates and then processing the PRs, you know, every month or so. And and to be honest, I haven't done it since he left. Um, so it means that that skills slowly get out of date as the skill gets updated, but the, the translations don't. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that that's, that's led to is, is, well, I don't know if it's led to it, but, you know, some languages try and submit PRs directly to the, to the skill repos, but it's just not possible for us to process that many PRs when, you know, we're talking about, as Josh says, potentially thousands of languages, thousands of skills, you know, multiplied by each other times the number of updates. <laughs> It's like it just doesn't work. So we need we need good processes around that. Oh, that sounds great. Um, is there a ticket for that? There is. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, great answer. <laughs> I'm gonna go make sure it's up to date, but there is a ticket. <laughs> okay. So is that uh, uh, is that it for you guys? Uh. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, Hacktoberfest is going on as well. Um, that's slightly more annoying this year because they're trying to not be as annoying to projects that aren't participating, but it makes it more annoying for people that are participating. Anyway, you just have to label tag things a, a lot more, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Derek, um, can you give us an update on uh, what you're up to and the latest on the the uh, SJ201s. Sure. Yeah, so um, I did an update on the SJ201s first. So I've been talking a little bit with Kevin today and our assembler, which is called Advanced Assembly. And things are on track to get the 20 boards by the 16th. Um, yeah, so the next Friday. Um, <clears throat> and then they'll be overnighted to Kevin um and he'll do all his bring up tests and stuff and make sure all, all's good and then kind of distribute them to the rest of us um well they'll come to me <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so that's uh all smooth sailing there were some parts uh that had to be shipped to them so it did go a little slower than what we'd hoped um a couple days slower than what we would have liked but that's about uh, as quick as we could get it done um <clears throat> so yeah all's good there uh, we ordered, so I've been kind of ordering a bunch of parts and stuff for the 20, um, the, the purchase parts outside of the, outside of the board. So the speakers and the displays and the cables and screws and all that good stuff. Um, and working a little bit also on the, the, the more production. So most of the parts right now we're getting through kind of easy to acquire distributors. Um, so they're not the same distributors we'll use for, for production. So I'm working on that as well, um, getting some samples sent from those distributors <clears throat> in the cheaper price ranges for the displays and the speakers. And then um, actually I've been really just fighting some 3D printer troubleshooting the last day uh I, I got the ultimaker back up and going but it was having some weird issues where it would just freeze uh, during the middle of a print so i had to troubleshoot that and just end up being a basically a day on that um ended up finally just reverting to a pretty old slicer um, and that got around it for now um but i am as of uh, yesterday afternoon, back in printing mode. So I've got um, the Ultimaker going, and I will have the Form Labs going. Um, so we'll be churning out parts. And I talked to Kevin a little bit too. He's up for printing some. Um, he's got two pretty good uh, FDM style printers. So going to get him to print at least stuff for him. Uh, so we don't have to do that. And uh, Josh is on standby to, to print stuff as well. I think he's, he's actually working on one right now. Um, so yeah, I have the printers here. I have the printers here running flat out. So 
so I'm printing multiple units simultaneously across both printers and keeping them running 24 hours a day. Nice. In case so, you yeah. hadn't noticed, I'm super, I'm super excited that we're going to have an actual NoShip product. <laughs> so I'll probably get a hold of you uh, tomorrow, Josh, with a new file or the files for the fully 3D printed version. Um, but I'm for our purposes, uh, kind of what we talked on Monday, you know, the laser cut design with the 3D printed acoustic chamber is going to be um, plenty fine for us uh, to do a lot of our, our stuff on. So, um, but we should be able to do a lot of, we need to talk about um, how many of the 3D printed ones we want to do because Project Rollover has um, basically the, the ones that they had were 3D printed designs and if we really want to replace them one-to-one, -one, we, we probably want to allocate a lot of resources to doing that. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather not send them the, uh, the laser cut ones. Right. <clears throat> So yeah, I'm kind of gearing up to get that that done as fast as we can. Was a decision made about what to do if we have one of the um, last Rev SJ201s, and can we send those into Kevin and have them fixed, or are they just garbage? Well, I think we send them to Kevin, but I don't. I think they're they're garbage. I mean, I don't think it's worth fixing them since we've had enough changes. That's my two cents. I don't know, Michael. What do you think? <clears throat> Um, I think hold on to it actually, um, at least until, uh, we get everything up and running. Um, they are ultimately their garbage, uh, because, uh, they're, the firmware is going to be different between these. This, you know, this is what rev D, um, and we had to replace one of the chips. So the volume control, for example, is not going to be the same as it was before. Is that true? No, that's not true. The volume control is the same. Uh, the audio path is different. Um, so that was actually the one problem that we're really solving with the spin is uh, having a single audio path output instead of a dual audio path output. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that'll be uh, a little tiny bit of a change um, on the firmware side. So, you know, uh, Ken should not, definitely not get rid of his um, and you may want to hold on to yours for now anyway. I think the only other thing I've been up to that's worth mentioning is, um, yeah, I was kind of curious, would, you know, Chris, Chris V, you and I should talk a little bit more about the, the mobile side of the tagger. Because um, most of the mock-ups, you know, all the mock-ups we've done, and I think the only thing I'm, I'm not really worried about anything in the design, I think, so, you know, everything is based on what we've done before in terms of layout and stuff. So we know how it flows for mobile except for the selecting of the clip. That's the one part that I might, we might need to think about a little bit more. Just we sure. detect if people are on a certain type of, or like, you know, detect if it's a touch screen or whatever, certain size screen and give people only certain tasks that don't require them to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, I vote, my I vote for guys. I vote for Gez's solution rather than trying to like get into fancy de design stuff. Why don't we just limit the clips that get sent to mobile to clips that are appropriate for mobile? There's nothing more annoying than companies trying to wedge non-mobile tasks onto a mobile device. Like let's just like we'll, we'll just use the binary ones on mobile. That should be really straightforward. Yeah, that works. <clears throat> okay. Keep it simple. <clears throat> Great. So I, I guess that's everyone. Um, no, I have. I have, I have updates. Uh, oh, I actually, I actually work now, or I'm starting to work. So um, I, uh, I have backups running. I sent a, 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 it's it's not classified as nasty gram, but it's on the border of it. Uh, to to Ken and, and Chris V yesterday about the, the distribution of the data in the root of the storage server. So if you guys could get in there, I'm grabbed, I may be done grabbing an entire copy of it, but if we could get that organized or if it's not organized, at least get a readme file that says what the hell everything is. There's like backup and then backups and then there's wake words and then wake underscore words and then 
combinations of those things in various cases. Um, so I'm grabbing those and that, that process will be automated. I will also take the extra hour it takes to document it and drop a document somewhere so people can understand it. Um, I also expose the server here to the broader internet so that it can be accessed uh, through a public IP. So you guys should be able to get in and out and do what you need to do on the server here. Um, and then I resolve the issues with the permissions have gotten artificially restricted. And I, I did want to ask, did that happen on purpose? Because like Gez was locked out and a bunch of the passwords were set to, to you couldn't view them. And I know that the default permissions in LastPass can be a bit restrictive. But was there a reason that we had Gez locked out of a bunch of folders and stuff? Nothing I did. Okay, so I kicked it all open and gave Gez access to everything. So. So for all you hackers out there, like all you need to do is get guys to click on your email and you uh, can do your thing. I didn't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> but be warned, he's not running Windows, so you're going to have to get him to pull pull down your little shell script and run it with his credentials. Uh, the next step for me is to push on the um, either it's it looks like the the it looks like the choice is going to be between Ubuntu and Panticore, and it may end up being a combination of both. So we may end up using Panticore to deal with operating system level stuff and firmware level stuff, and then use Ubuntu to do application level updates. Uh, use Snappy to do that. Um, but I'm gonna start with something super simple like a shell script, change a line, and figure out how we push these updates out to the devices in a secure way that it doesn't cause a bunch of headaches. And evaluate software from various different folks. I'm still evaluating Bolina, so if the Bolina sales rep is listening, it would be awesome if you would actually show up for your meeting because it's hard for me to buy stuff from you if you don't show up. Uh, and uh, and that's pretty much that for me. And then simultaneously, I have all the printers cleaned, running, full out. Like I'll order some more resin and some more PLA. But um, Derek, as soon as you send me updated designs, I'll start the printers on that and then uh, start working on on a maybe a more efficient scheduling mechanism. But um, yeah, I think that the answer to your question about when do we stop 3D printing and the answer is when the injection molded parts start showing up. Like until then, once we have designs and we're happy, especially with the PLA where the incremental costs are the electricity and like a $20 spool of plastic, um, I think we get super efficient at printing them and we print them as fast as we can and we get them in the hands of as many people as possible. Um, even if they're just evaluations for Folks like our friends at NASA, who is looking at sending Mycroft into space. That's all I really have. In space. All right. Um, okay, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for that update. Um, yeah, things are really moving along here. Uh, it's it's getting it's getting very exciting. Uh, I think that uh, by the end of this year, we will have uh, lots of lots more great news. So. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, so that's it for this dev thing, unless anyone's got any final final words, any last words. I came up with the best phrases on my meetings. I was I was actually curious about I, I saw one of my emails, the uh, newsletter, the uh, that pop socket thing. What is what's that all about? Oh, or the uh, we didn't talk about that, did we? Uh, okay, so there's a company, there's a Kickstarter out there that I ran across called TalkSocket. And basically what they've done is they've jammed a wake word recognizer into a pop socket. And that's got a little Bluetooth connector on it. So guess what this does? It allows you to install third-party voice assistants on any phone. Because the key to the, one of the major blockers that we've had in terms of getting, you know, a Mycroft even conceptually onto an Android or an iPhone is that you can't use their listener uh, for pretty obvious reasons. They don't want just anybody to have a permission to just listen to the microphone all the time, right? Um, so in that sense, they're protecting their users. But at the same time, there's absolutely zero room for third parties to come in uh, like ourselves or even Amazon uh, to put their uh, voice assistants onto a phone. So they've solved this in a very clever way. And I saw this and uh, you know, we got in touch with them. and they've said that they will support Mycroft as well. So they originally were created to uh, be able to install Amazon onto uh, Android phones and, and iPhones. Uh, but uh, you know, we called them up, we talked with them, and they're super happy to support our, our wake word as well. Uh, and that will uh, basically clear the path for us to have a, uh, you know, a mobile uh, version of Mycroft. 
So uh, there's no schedule for that right now. Um, it's definitely not going to impede our progress with the Mark II, uh, but um, but it also you know uh, is uh, a really uh, clever solution to uh, a problem that we're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I encourage people to check it out. I think our Kickstarter is over at this point. Uh, they'll be moving on to the Indiegogo in demand, and um, and you can pick it up there. And um, yeah, uh, I, I thought it was really cool. So I can't wait for it to for it to come out, and uh, you know, hopefully sometime next year we'll uh, we'll be supporting that. And just as a reminder to the folks out there that might go and back this on Indiegogo or on Kickstarter, when you back an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter product, what you're doing is backing the journey, not buying the product, right? So this is not about like, hey, I can buy this thing and it will show up someday. This is about showing support for the ability to do an independent voice assistant um, using this little piece of hardware. Um, you know, they may or may not ship it. You know, they may or may not, you know, thread the needle to become a profitable company, but um, it's certainly a journey that we want to support, and we hope that they get to delivering hardware. But if they don't, I'm not going to be bent and go and melt down their personal Facebook page. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point. Um, I've, I've had quite a number of Kickstarter projects not materialize, um, but you know that's that's part of the game. So, uh, all right, uh, any other? Last things. There's 40 hours to go on the talks on the Kickstarter, so. Oh, okay, great. Jump in and do it if you want. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I will match that with a, a complete non sequitur, which is the clear gorilla glue is fantastic. I highly recommend it. All right. And uh, with that fantastic endorsement, uh, I think we'll call it a day. Thanks, everybody. See you on All the right. press.